Mexico, February 1984. A couple looks to move into a newly built house, part of a new neighborhood. They had been living in the same city for the last few years, but they wanted something that was a little bit larger. Moving out of the city would have been great, but the shipping costs for their belongings would have made it way too costly for them. So instead they decided to move into that new neighborhood that had these new, large and sturdy but ugly looking houses with a neat concrete foundation. While they are in the process of moving in, they both start experiencing nausea and a slight headache. They don't think much of it and continue with what they are doing. A few days later, however, their symptoms seem to have worsened. They are now experiencing what seems like a fever, which was a little bit unusual for the time. Flu season had just ended and neither of them had ever suffered any major sickness, but little did they know that it was in fact the concrete foundation of their new home that was making them sick. The time of the Walkman, Rubik's Cubes, Floppy Disks, Arcade, but also the time of landfills where some of these products might have inevitably ended up. In that time there was a particular philosophy to waste management, philosophy is used very loosely here, but it was called dilute and disperse. The idea that waste could be disposed of by diluting it and then spreading it out over a large surface area. This was done by simply making 3 meter deep holes in the ground, liquefying the waste and then evenly filling the pits after which the top layer was compressed. Some of these were also lined with a particular material so that things could be held together a little bit more efficiently. And initially that seems like a really good idea, until you consider that these solutions are not permanent and that the waste could outlast the integrity of the landfills holding it. Los Alamos, New Mexico, late January 1984. Few workers of the National Laboratory were alerted by a lab's radiation alarm. The laboratory had its safety precautions as storage and experimentation with dangerous materials was common practice. The alarm was also regularly tested outside of the incidents that had happened in the past. The lab was no less known for being the place where the Manhattan Project took place. This time around though, things were a little bit different. A source was found outside of the facility, not inside. It seemed as though a truck carrying several hundreds of table legs and which was lost on its way to its original destination had somehow triggered the alarm. Not only that, but the amount of radiation coming off it was at least two times the lethal dose. The truck was moved to a more secure location, so it could be examined and cleaned. Object permanence is the idea that objects continue to exist even if they are not directly looked at. The term is usually used to describe the cognitive abilities of toddlers, so it doesn't have anything to do with waste management. I could make a joke about how people who litter are like toddlers, but that's not very friendly to toddlers, and that seems like a bit of a cheap joke. But the more I think about it, the more it makes sense, especially the ones that do it intentionally. People who litter just think that the objects they leave behind will magically stop existing, or that something is going to make that happen for them. On a more serious note, I do think something interesting can be said about object permanence. In her paper, Knowing Waste Towards an Inhumane Epistemology, professor and scholar of the School Environmental Studies of Canada, Mira J. Hurt describes how waste management is rationalized by technological means and that it is something that technology can offer a complete solution for, even though it fails to cover an exhaustive list of practical considerations. This makes that the solutions only work to a certain extent and that over time they become outdated and will either have to be adapted or replaced. 
The technology that is used to solve the issue in a way stops us from thinking about the possible ways in which it could be insufficient, until it practically fails to account for something unexpected. Whereas waste is usually permanent, the technology that tries to deal with it is not and has to be improved constantly. Another thing that might be good to consider is that even though the technology exists, does not mean it's used everywhere. An obvious example would be places that simply can't afford it, and in other places it might be more of whether it's um, convenient or profitable to invest in it. In addition to the problem of permanence, landfills have a few other issues. First of all, the amount of waste back in the 80s was still relatively low and it could be accounted for, but not for very long. As production and consumption increased, more surface area would have to be dedicated to waste management. The second and arguably more severe consequence that had to be dealt with was leachate. This could be considered one of the practical considerations I mentioned earlier. While some precautions were taken and a few layers were used to keep in as much as possible, there were still a lot of water soluble components that could barely be filtered enough to prevent them from getting out into things like groundwater. And it should be mentioned that these layers could fail as well, so it's not exactly a good way of going about waste management. Dilute and disperse is not the only way to deal with waste. There's another way. Concentrate and contain does the exact opposite and packs as much as possible into a small volume. To give an idea of how the two are different, if you were to um, clean your room, whatever that means, you could evenly spread out your trash across the floor, that would be dilute and disperse. But if instead you were to put all of it in the corner of your room, that would be concentrate and contain. So, concentrate and contain is more space efficient, but also more labor intensive, and in some cases can lead to more severe consequences when the technology used to contain it fails. Now, I was initially going to dunk on dilute and disperse because of its issues, but first of all that would be very environmentally unfriendly, and second, it would be a waste of my time to do so. There are different methods like incineration, recycling and a number of others, that also have their own advantages and disadvantages, but all of them have one thing in common, which is that none of them actually get rid of the waste completely. Unless you could somehow break the law of the conservation of mass or the law of the conservation of energy, there's no way you're ever going to get rid of it completely. Incineration, for instance, while it can produce energy, also has new pollutants like carbon dioxide as products. And recycling gets rid of it initially by turning it into a new product, but any malfunctions or additional pollutants will have to be monitored, fixed and cleaned before it can be used again. So in all cases the waste management does not get rid of anything, it only puts it away temporarily and you'll have to keep inspecting it in order to keep it from getting out in such a way that it is harmful to the environment because when it does get out, the consequences can be severe. Bioaccumulation is the buildup of harmful chemicals within an organism or species, either through direct absorption or through intake via the food chain. Okay, so what do I mean by that? In a food chain, you've got the producers at the very bottom, these are usually plants of some sort, and above that you've got the primary consumers, secondary consumers, tertiary consumers, and so on. Because each consumer consumes more than one individual of the group below it, it causes any persistent chemicals to be absorbed and magnified in quantity, which causes the concentration of the chemical to increase as you go up the food chain. Now, some of you might say this is a fractal, I had to bring it up somewhere, my channel is about fractals after all, but I would disagree. The way I've depicted it here isn't all that accurate, uh, it's just to demonstrate its theoretical workings somewhat, but practically speaking bioaccumulation doesn't work in these discrete steps and is more like a spectrum of gradually increasing concentration. 
This is mainly because the amount of absorbed chemicals can vary per individual, which means that you get a range of different concentrations instead of one set concentration. That aside though, bioaccumulation can seriously impact the environment, but it can also be a huge problem for humans as well. Methyl mercury is a good example of this. The compound occurs naturally as it is generated by a microbial process, but in order for that to happen the mercury needs to be there in the first place, and an estimated 70% of it enters the environment through human action. There are several industries that initially used mercury, as it was used in the process of making hats, but also until recently in thermometers, and it's still used in vapor lamps, electrical switches, and equipment like Calowell electrodes. The way the mercury then travels up the food chain is often through aquatic life, and it then ends up in organisms like tuna and swordfish, which some people find really tasty, but that also puts them at a higher risk of a high mercury exposure, which in turn puts them at risk of mercury poisoning, which can have severe consequences, especially when it gets to the brain. Juarez, early January 1984. Mr. Vincente, a maintenance worker and electrician, was tasked with having a look at the storage unit of the medical center of specialties to find any redundant materials and sell them. There wasn't much of interest apart from a particular machine that was used to treat people with a certain type of cancer. He proceeded to take off the casing and eventually found that a heavy and well secured container had been removed from the machine. Curious as to what was inside the container, he decided to break it open with a hammer and he found that it was filled with a large number of small metal pellets. He then decided to go to the nearby scrapyard to see for how much he could sell these. He loaded all of it on the back of his pickup truck and then went on his way. Both during the process of loading the materials into the truck and during the ride, little pellets that leaked from the container found their way to places inside and outside the truck and on the land surrounding the roads they rode along. Once at the scrapyard, the materials were sold and taken off the truck using a large electrical magnet. Most of it went well, except for the container with the pellets. Whatever the material that was made of seemed to be difficult to remove this way, and a lot of pellets ended up being spilled. Majority of it still seemed usable and was sold to a steel manufacturer where it was incorporated in steel that was later made into rebar steel, which is used to reinforce concrete. It was also used to make table legs that would then be shipped to several places within Mexico and the US. With all the previous examples I've mainly focused on rubbish which is digestible material and trash which is indigestible. Chemical waste is a little bit of a different issue. A lot of the time chemical waste is foreign to the environment which means that the waste does not occur naturally and that its effects on nature can be more severe and sometimes even unaccounted for either because of its composition or concentration or both. But generally these are still the same in that all of them have chemical or biological processes that make them harmful when they get into the environment. Which cannot necessarily be said about nuclear or radioactive waste. This can definitely be said in relation to bioaccumulation. While in some cases bioaccumulation can work in similar ways as with normal chemical waste. The way of which the effects of the bioaccumulation manifest is dependent on the chemical properties and the physical properties of the isotopes involved. The 2011 reactor meltdown in Fukushima released a lot of cesium-137 and while there are large spikes of the isotope just afterwards and while it does bioaccumulate the effect and the exact impact it has is still a little bit of a hot topic and I don't feel comfortable making any hard claims about, but I do want to highlight that it shows that it isn't always straightforward and that bioaccumulation doesn't always have the same effects. Having said that, radioactive waste is different because you don't have to physically touch it in order to experience its harmful effects. Whereas with chemical waste you could walk past the vat of chemical waste without experiencing any of its negative effects. If you were to do that with a vat of nuclear waste, 
uh, you would definitely experience the effect because the radiation coming off it can still get to you. The aforementioned management techniques still work, but in a lesser extent because you have to account for this property. In a way you have to be way more careful with what you do with it. Another thing to mention is that the radiation coming off this type of waste isn't going to be there forever, but it can be there for a very long time. And depending on the isotope, the amount of radiation and the type can vary. Different isotopes have different half-lives because of their decay rates and that determines the amount of radiation and the type of radiation that comes of it. And if you keep that in mind, you only need a very small amount of a particular isotope to get out into the environment to make things go very wrong. Now, there's one particular case I would like to highlight, uh, which is hospitals. The radioactive waste usually comes from the radiological parts of the hospital, where it is used for x-rays and other imaging techniques. Generally, there are two different categories of radioactive waste. There's short half-life isotopes and long half-life isotopes. But there's also distinctions in whether the waste is solid, liquid or gaseous. And there's also distinctions in intensity, where high, medium and low activity are the different categories. The process follows two steps, the first of which is the collection, and after that the collected waste is disposed of. And as you might be able to guess, how the different types are collected and disposed of depends on the categories they are in. Practically speaking, if we just look at the half-lives, there are two types, those which decay in a short amount of time, which makes them easier to dispose, and those that need a little bit more time to decay because of their long half-lives. The half-lives in this case can vary from a few days to months to years even. So the ones that take longer to decay and the ones that are more dangerous tend to be contained, and the ones that uh, decay faster can potentially be disposed of by diluting it and then disposing of it. We're also talking about very small amounts here. Um, well, yeah, okay, it doesn't actually solve the problem, it just moves it. The machine that had been broken open was used to treat prostate cancer. The way it did that was to irradiate the appropriate location by exposing it to beta radiation. The amounts of radiation coming off this source could be pretty dangerous when not used in the correct dosage. To resolve this problem, rather than just having one large source, Several thousand small pellets were securely stored inside the machine. The source for this radiation was cobalt-60. Cobalt, in general, is also used to reinforce steel. To put all of this together, the pellets of the old irradiator got lost during the process of being shipped to the scrapyard, were then spread out further over the scrapyard and then finally the remaining pellets were sold to be put into steel and it was then used to make table legs and concrete foundations for houses in a new neighborhood, leading to people being exposed to dangerous amounts of radiation, at best only temporarily weakening their immune system or at worst leading to severe or even lethal radiation poisoning. Same goes for the truck with the table legs, which, if you remember, was moved to a more secure location. Which was a national park. They, they moved it to a national park, uh, where it wasn't exactly far away from people. And when it comes to the steel, about 90% of all contaminated steel in the US was recovered. But in Mexico, only about 26% was recovered. And finally, there's the spilled pellets on the scrapyard and the road towards it. Months after, people still had difficulties tracking down those pellets and collecting them. The scrapyard was straight up dangerous, the roads around it less so, but the pellets were more difficult to track down there. And what's even worse is that the people who were supposed to clean it up weren't given any safety equipment. The exact number that got into contact with the radiation is estimated to be only about 200 people, uh, but it's mostly unknown. Tracking down the people who had been affected by this is really tricky. Attempts have been made to find out if people in the area have suffered from genetic damage from the radiation, but, but no definitive number has ever been given for the number of victims that has suffered this damage. 
Although it could be speculated that at least the people who had been in direct contact with it, including the maintenance workers, scrapyard workers, the truck drivers and the people cleaning up the mess will probably have caught a large enough dose. What's even more tricky is to figure out how many other people got into contact with it. The electrician's pickup truck is another potential source of unsuspecting victims. Not all the pallets had been removed from the pickup truck and on the way back from the scrapyard something in the truck malfunctioned and had to be repaired. The truck was parked somewhere in the city and it stood there for a few months. So people could just walk up to the truck and without even knowing it get exposed to the radiation coming off of the pallets. So the number of victims is not known at this point. And uh, it might also be good to mention that the scenario in the intro might not have literally happened, but it could be a possible scenario which has simply gone undocumented. Something that might be good to bring up by now is responsibility. Because in incidents like these, people tend to get fired over them. Sometimes rightfully so, sometimes maybe not. Mr. Vincente, the electrician from earlier, was fired as a result of this incident, which I can understand, but where was the intervention in the whole process? Why did this have to come down to dumb luck? If this had been caught earlier, it could have saved a lot more people uh, from being affected by this. And maybe it could have prevented Mr. Vincente from being fired because the consequences wouldn't have been so severe. So let's break down the chain of events and see at which point things could have been improved to prevent part of the disaster from happening. Mr. Vincente, the electrician wasn't qualified to handle the equipment in the storage space, which is probably what led him to getting fired, but the hospital got the equipment from another hospital and while they got it, there was literally nobody ever qualified to handle the equipment in the first place. So first of all, it's kind of ironic, but it also prompts the question of whether the electrician had been instructed to handle the equipment or not or even if he even knew what the equipment contained. And did the hospital that sold it know that there weren't any people around to properly handle the equipment? And if they did, why did they sell the equipment anyway? Another curious thing was that the unit that contained the cobalt had already been removed from the equipment before the electrician even handled it, uh, which prompts even more questions. The scrapyard could be another place where we could ask a few questions. Do they check any of the materials coming in or going out of the scrapyard on radioactivity, for example? Had the capsule been detected here, it could have saved a lot of effort tracking down the majority of the cobalt. Uh, one step further, uh, what about the steel factory? Did they check the materials going in and out the factory to see if it's okay? And then there's the border which even at that time was greatly concerned with denying people entry into the country and you know certain materials but they didn't catch this why didn't they catch this so it almost seems like more than one person could be considered responsible here the idea that uh, more people could be responsible for an incident isn't specific to this situation from the 80s. There are numerous examples uh, where responsibility isn't as clear cut. Just to give an idea, let's have a look at another one. Let's take a look at the fire at Chemiepak in Moerdijk, the Netherlands. which happened 10 years ago at the time of writing the script. Oh yes, this one's a little bit controversial, but I'll try to do my best to do this properly. The fire that happened there in 2011 is one of the most frequently discussed industrial disasters in the last few decades. And because of that, uh, it shapes the way we look at industrial disasters as a whole. So much so that I've even had test questions about it for toxicology. Chemipak is a company which mixes, packages and stores a large number of different chemicals. 
The fire that happened there caused more than a hundred different chemicals to be either ejected into the air or seep into the ground. Just after it happened, about 500 people living nearby were reported to have suffered as a result of the disaster. And even 10 years later, people are still cleaning the terrain and it is estimated to take up to 2023 until the terrain is properly cleaned. The cause of the fire is a result of both unfortunate circumstances but also human action. The initial fire was caused by a pump catching fire because of someone defrosting it with a gas burner. And from this it would be very convincing to see that it was the action of an individual that led to the fire, but as it turns out it's a little bit more complicated than that. The pump that was used to transfer the resin from the tank to a different storage container was flushed with xylene before it was used. Because of that, the pump had been placed in a shallow metal container so that any excess xylene or resin could drip into that and that way it wouldn't end up all over the place. Now, it's important to know that both the xylene and the resin being transferred were quite flammable, so keep that in mind. At the time it was cold, it was even freezing and the pump wasn't really equipped to deal with that. It didn't really work under those conditions, especially because the resin was difficult to transfer because it became more viscous as it cooled down. So the pump had to be warmed up and that was done with a gas torch. So you can probably see where this is going. The torch ignited the vapor coming off the xylene in the container below it. The increased heat from the flames caused the resin to expand, causing the tube of the side of the output to pop off, which caused the resin to spill into the flames below it, and outside of the container as well. The people nearby tried to extinguish the flames, but the feedback loop advanced too quickly for them to get it under control, and the flames then spread to the outside of the container. Nearby there were several containers which had other chemicals in them. The flames got closer to the containers and it started weakening them and eventually the contents spilled out, causing the fire to grow even more. And this eventually led to the fire consuming most of the terrain and the terrain adjacent to it. All of this kind of seems like a coincidence but it turns out that a lot of this could have been prevented. Because of the amount and the danger of the chemicals that were typically stored there, there were several strict regulations that had to be followed. But it turns out that those storage protocols weren't followed properly. The large containers were stacked on places where they didn't belong and the containers themselves weren't secure enough, which had been pointed out a few years ago, but almost no efforts were made to look into this. Handling the xylene required special procedures to be followed, which weren't done in this case, and while the defrosting with the gas storage was especially dangerous here, it was in fact common practice. And during audits, different and usually less risky work was done in order to attempt to hide this, uh, so they couldn't get in trouble for that. However, even though that local authorities had noticed that things weren't up to standard, they neglected to take any action against it, and all that led to different parties accusing each other of incompetence. So far I've been building things up, layering one problem onto another, which considering we're talking about landfills is kind of appropriate, I guess. But I still haven't given any solution to this, and if you were looking for one then good luck, because I don't know. But I can give a little insight in what I think is the key to resolving this, and that is to keep making observations. The Mexico cobalt incident was described during one of my physics lessons on radioactivity to give an example of how radioactivity can be very dangerous even in relatively small amounts. It nicely demonstrates that, but there is another aspect which was not talked about that would have definitely been useful if it was highlighted, which is responsibility, but even more importantly, uh, why chemical and physical analysis is so important in the first place. As I've said, the firing of Mr. Vincente might have been for good reasons, but he by far was not the only person that could have been seen as responsible for the disaster. And firing him did not get rid of any systemic issues leading to an inability to detect the radioactive materials, leading to an escalation of something that could have been dealt with appropriately if there had been checks along the way. 
if a quality assurance system had been in place in at least one link of the chain, it could have massively reduced the number of people affected by this. If there were more than that, even more so. It would also have made it easier to deal with any of the consequences and the responsibility aspects. Because potential disasters can more easily be detected and the cause can more easily be tracked down. Whether this should also lead to more people being fired for these uh, can still be very much dependent on the circumstances. But if mistakes can be found earlier then that could minimize the cost of any mistake which in turn can make it less likely for people to lose their job, which arguably is a good thing. When disasters are being described, examples like Chernobyl, the Halifax explosion and the deep water horizon spill tend to be brought up as examples, which is understandable. Uh, they are events where large amounts of chemicals are violently ejected into the environment, but not all disasters start off like that. More often than not, it is the lack of a perceived severity that can make a disaster like that of Mexico seem as if it is not dangerous, until it's too late and more damage has come from it than was initially expected. It is understandable to use obvious examples, but if you ask me, compared to a threat that can be seen directly, a threat that cannot be observed directly in a way is way more terrifying because it can build up over time. Sometimes danger lies in the mundane and sometimes that can be something as mundane as waste. The things you dispose of today might come back to haunt you in the future. Thanks for watching. I hope this video wasn't a waste of your time.